Graph. Oh, no. All right, we're live. Oh, here we are. Oh, howdy, folks. Welcome. I've got a haircut today. To our Saturday Night Live. Yeah, that's just a regular thing. It's a regular thing. I guess we're talking about star sharpening. If you don't know why you're here, it's to support the Purple Heart Project. I don't know what I can point to. Which we start in three weeks from tomorrow. Three weeks tomorrow, first class. Yep. Which will be class number 27. And uh, seven combat wounded vets, seven civilians will be here for six days, seven days actually. So if you want to help out tonight, and the big news is, and I'll announce this several times, is just this past Friday, Ken? Friday, we, we, yeah, we, 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 so we are now an official, um, registered, registered charity in Canada, as well as a 501c3 in the United States. That means all your donations can be, uh, tax deductible. And Ken's going to tell you a little about something else a little bit later. We get some more people on about how you can double your donation possibly. Frick, if you want to throw a question at me, I will. Absolutely. First question. Frick's all excited because he's leaving for Florida tomorrow. Or yeah. as, or as, um, as uh, Jerry's father would say. Del Boca Vista. No, no. <laughs> How I'm does going. he say Florida? He doesn't say Florida. He goes. Florida. 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 Going to be in the swimming pool. Yeah, the shuffleboard. Uh, okay, first question comes from California. <laughs> Uh, Hello, California. Jim Green says, Hi, Jim. how much set do you recommend for the teeth on a rip cut and cross cut panel saw? Well, interesting that you should ask that question. So on ours, Jake, can you follow me? Yeah, where are you going? Right here. Okay. On ours, notice the saw tail. This could be yours. We specifically designed these saws for dry furniture grade wood. So what's that mean? That means unlike construction lumber, which has a moisture content of uh, 15 plus, we're talking about moisture contents in the uh, six to eight range. So we made our saws with just two th three thousand of an inch set per side. And what that does is it gives you a thinner, narrow, narrower curve Narrower curve literally rests on the sides of the blade, and that's what makes for a nice straight cut. So, depending on what you're doing, I like a narrow set. And three thou on the uh, three thou on the panel saws, and we go two thou on our joinery cross cut dovetail tenon. You're about to, stuck, stuck, about to step on your pen, Ken. Oh, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> so, uh, if you're just doing furniture grade woods, I'd, I'd be down in the three to thou range. If you're using construction lumber, then you're going to have to have more than that, probably up around the five. Next, Rick, please. I broke a tooth today, so I'm talking with a lisp. Okay, next one comes from Matt in Florida. Hi, Matt, in Florida. Where in Florida? Doesn't say. Well, if you ask him, he'll tell you. All right, Matt, let us know. Let we'll us know if you'll be clean. in uh, one of our seminars in the next couple of weeks. Oh, yes. So we are going to be, we are going to be in Orlando. Dates, please. Uh, give me a at, the Orlando Wood, at the Orlando Woodcraft Store on 28th and 29th. Uh, Thursday's the 28th. So, uh, the 28th, which is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Thursday's training for them. On the 29th and 30th then. Yep. On the 29th, which is a Friday, it's a dovetail seminar all day, including your lunch. And it'll cover everything planes. And on the 30th, it's going to be a dovetail day. Cover everything dovetails. In the morning, it'll be through dovetails. The afternoon, it'll be half blind, including your lunch. So contact the store and sign up. And then the following weekend, which will be April, give me the date, somebody. Uh, 5th and 6th. On the 5th and 6th, 
Same repeat of what we did in Orlando, only we're going to be doing it at the, clear, at the Clearwater store in Clearwater, Florida. What was the question? Question from Matt was, how do you straighten a kinked or dented saw plate? Uh, hi, Matt. Um, mine, Miley Nelson's got brutalized. The students would use them and they would hit the concrete floor and you can't see that very well, but some, t I mean, you can just, and it, well, I would put it, get as close, get as close to the bend as you can, put it in a vise, and then bend it right on that vent, opposite of where that bend is, and hopefully, is he, is, um, is, uh, um, Matt? Frick? Yes, Matt. That guy right there. Irvin? Irvin. Is Irvin doing Instagram? Yeah, I'm, I had to log you back in. So that's how, that's, what I, that's how we do it. And, and when we're making saws, we often, the blades will be bent for whatever reason. So we've got to go in, and I made a little jig with a couple of dowels, three dowels standing fairly close. You could set it down in, you could move it wherever you needed to, and just bend, bend opposite with the bend, bend the saw opposite where the kink is. And almost, we can always get them out. So hey, what about a dent? Oh, he said dent. I think I got a dent in one of these too. No, it's in the, the other ones are over there, shoot. Um, I don't know. I mean, I suppose you could try laying it on a, on a flat piece of steel and hitting it with a flat part of the hammer, try to take that dent out, but I haven't, uh, I haven't tried to remove a dent. I got a really bad kink in uh, a couple of my old Lee Nil my old, not that old, Lee Nilsons. The bends are easy, the kinks, eh, not so. Next, Frick. Okay. Hurry yourself over there. He's pretty... Mark Santanon in Adelaide, Australia wants to know when the maple resin impregnated handled saws would be available for purchase. Ah, uh, Mark, they're ready now. Mm. They're ready now. They're all boxed up. No. They're sitting over there. Some of them are ready now, but the, the manufacturing is not ready. No, we got them. If you want one, if you want one, get a hold of Gina. You go to support at robcosman.com. Tell Gina what you want. I've made it. How many have I made over there, Ken? Is it 10? There's, there's 10 dovetails, dovetail saws that are ready. We just, I'm trying to build the inventory up and we're trying to, we're trying to work all the bugs out and it's coming. We've got a lot of stuff, a lot of irons in the fire, trying to get this new plane out. That's uh, all of the stuff. Always something happening. Next, Frick. Uh, Jonathan Walsh in the chat asks, Hi, uh, Frick, did you make dinner tonight and what was it? <laughs> did Frick make dinner tonight? Yes, I did. It was a repeat of two weeks ago. We had, uh, we had kind of a barbecue. Frick did smash burgers. Yep. And uh, my mother-in-law, Elner, made potato salad. Somebody, somebody bought terrible coleslaw. That was me. That yeah, was Frick. <laughs> the good stuff wasn't in stock, so yes. Yeah, should have made it. You didn't work today. Didn't why time. That's why we had smash burgers. Next. Uh, next one comes from uh, John Root in Greenbar Greenbrier, Arkansas. Hi, How do you know when a saw needs sharpening? That's a good question. You know, I was thinking that today. I said, you know what, we really should address. Well, you can feel it. You can hear it. And uh, I wonder if we can actually do that. Because it applies, to, it applies. Well, let me actually, let me back up a little bit. Um, you can look at the shavings or the, the sawdust or the lack of sawdust. If it starts to drift to one side or the other, it needs sharpening. Something's going, going wrong. I'll take this piece of poplar and I'm gonna take two saws so this one is brand new. I literally took, got this from Ian earlier in the week. And I'm gonna go back here. I've got, I've got the history of our saws. Did that video come out yet? 
Or was that in the newsletter, Jake? I think it was a newsletter. So we did a uh, <coughs> we did a video on the history of my saw, how it started. So I'm going to grab one in here that I know is dull. And that's another thing you do. You can run your hands. Well, that's crosscut. That's what, that's not what we're going to talk about. Let me find one that I know has been used a lot. There. Okay. So listen, listen, listen to the listen to the way it cuts. There's another answer too. Watch this. One stroke, two stroke, three stroke. I try to put the same amount of pressure on it. One stroke, two stroke, three stroke. So 40% farther down. See, I, I think you could tell, I could tell the sound difference. And you can, the easiest way too, don't be afraid, is just run your fingers. Run your fingers on the uh, against the teeth, and I can do that, and and my, I can literally without cutting myself. But on this one, it it'll grab your it'll grab your fingers. You can't do it. You'd end up cutting into them. And you can see there's another one too. If you take some a uh, little bit of magnification. And you look at a sharp blade, you won't be able to see the point. You won't be able to see the actual tip. Show me the dull one. But if you get, take a dull one. The light will catch and you can actually see the point. It's, they're somewhat rounded over. I'm trying to think of where can find a better example. Uh, I don't know whether you're going to be able to, I don't think you're going to be able to pick that up on camera. To make a few more cuts with a sharp saw. That just sails through the wood. I don't know how I can get, how I can get up. That's sharp. It's not a great way to answer the question to say it f feels, because if you're new to this, how would you know? But it should, when you run your fingers on there, I'm gonna say it, it should feel really um, grabby. grabby? Mm -hmm. Really grabby. Like you, you, it grabs your fingers immediately, there's no sliding. And you know it's sharp. Good question, I'm not so sure the answer was as good as it could have been, but if I come up with something else profound, I'll let you know. Okay, next Frick. Hey, have we got the Instagram going? Yeah, Instagram's going. Uh, Troy is a little offended he was not invited for the Smash Burgers. Troy was a little offended. Who's Troy? The guy that used to play golf for us? Well, he's obviously fallen from grace. Quit the lousy job. Next Frick. Um, Tim Beach in Cedar Park, Texas. Hi, hey, Tim. What is the best way to store your saw so as to not to damage the set of the teeth? Ha! Huh. Best way to store your saw? One of those things. One of those things coming out, Jake. How far away are they? Uh, Get a real good answer for you. It's going to cost you a little bit. Have we got a sample? Where's the sample? What's right here? Right here. No, that's not it. Huh? Nope, that's not it. Well. That's not it. That's not even remotely near it. Well, I'll use it as an example until you can find the uh, other one. So we had, uh, we've got a friend who uh, makes stuff like this. And he's making, this is going to be different. He's making stuff, he's making, what, what's that one for? It must have been for the three-quarter saw. He's making saw cases. They're going to be made out of a fabric, but inside they have a lining that is called what? V. 
VCR. VCI. VCI. Vapor inhibitor. Corro no, vapor corrosion inhibitor. That's it. So in other words, it'll keep you soft from rusting. And the, the, we, we went from having a flap to it's actually a zipper. So you'll be able to put your saw in. Your saw will sit in a little plastic. Here, I got it coming. So this is the one for the, uh, for the bench, for the dovetail saw. And then there'll be some similar ones for your panel saws. What is this, Jake? Huh? That's not part of it, right? So your saw will go in here like this. There's a little uh, flap to hold it in place. Prototype. I'm not sure how that's supposed to go. Oh, it goes around like that. So your saw will sit like that. Now this one doesn't have it because it'll be a little bit crinkly, but has that, that VC eye in there. And then your zipper closed. So if you want to and really protect your saws well. And what? it'll have a little pack. Oh yeah, it'll have a little branding on it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, right. It'll have a little white patch well, that you tan, tan, and you can write on it which saw it is, so that you're not having to go through and open them all up to try to find your cross cut, your dovetail, your medium tenon, whatever. So, aside from that, how do I store mine? Well, these ones go fit on a handle right here, like so. So that sits just like that. Um, these ones sit in a wooden till, a little bit fancy. They sit down in there. I got so many tool cabinets. The tool cabinet out there, they just sit on, on uh, handle things on the inside. But, I mean, uh, I would, I wouldn't that want them clashing they were, they were together. Stored, they were stored in that left one, weren't they? No. They weren't? No. Oh, it was, it was down on the bottom. The blades were held in. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, just as long as, oh, here, Ken, do we have a, do we have a strip of that, uh, that's a good idea. Where, do we have a strip of that sawtooth guard? Didn't I just bring a, just, a, I, oh, I sent it to Florida. So we have this material. Do you know where it is? Would you grab me one? I know where it is. It's in by Ian's bench, right in behind the, right in behind the buffer by Ian's bench. There was a bunch of it there. You would just bring me one piece of that. I'll show him. So uh, when Ken comes back, I'll show you. And that's, this is probably the best. And I don't know where you can buy it, but it probably easy. If you want, just call us. We'll sell you a little piece. But it's a, it's a good thing for, for protecting. You said protecting the set. You're protecting the set, protecting your teeth, keeping them from getting dinged up when you're not using it. Next, Freck, please. Um, what are you doing way over there? You antisocial? Oh, oh, you're watching the that. Instagram camera's there. Uh, Paul Laws in Bledsoe, UK. Hi, Paul. I'm sorry? Bledsoe, UK is where he's from. Hi, Paul, in the UK. You often mention the set of a saw and how this affects... I don't see a question here. You often mention the saw, the set of the saw and how this affects the size of the kerf. Mm. Yeah. I can explain that. Yeah, explain that. I think okay. that's what So... And, uh, I mean, I, gotta, I have to keep reminding myself. We're dealing with people who are just picking this up, and where would you learn all this stuff if somebody didn't tell you? So this is my dovetail saw. And the saw plate, you refer to it as the blade, if you were to, if you were to mic that, meaning measure it, it, you measure it, well, I can tell them. I just tell them. It's just not that important. So the thickness of this saw plate right here is 20 thousandths of an inch. And to make that easy, that's five sheets of paper. Writing paper is four one thousandths of an inch, so if you put five of them together, that's the thickness of your saw plate. However, if you tried to make a cut in a piece of wood by just merely cutting teeth, you wouldn't get in there more than like that, and it would just jam, stick, not moving. I think the orange hammer one doesn't have any set. Well, that's all right. I don't want to get too complicated on this. 
So what they do, or what we do, is we apply set to the teeth. So that means your first tooth, you're going to bend to the right or to the left, doesn't matter. The second tooth, you bend the opposite way. And so they just, they have a little, they have a little tool that pushes the tooth over. Like that. So that sits down on here. There's a little, uh, there's a little plunger right there. I don't know if you can see it. This one wouldn't work on this because it's too, it's just too big. But that would, that would work on a bigger saw. So you set it down like that. And the plunger pushes a tooth over against this anvil. So this anvil, if you, if you can tell, has a sloped face on it. But the slope changes and gets shallower and shallower, less and less, as you go around. So you, want, you determine how much set you want. You loosen this up. You turn that anvil to where it is you want. Tighten it up again. And then that goes up against the blade, so it's just pushing against the tooth. So each tooth is bent either to the right or to the left, opposite of the one in front of it. Now what happens is when you make your saw cut, instead of having a saw kerf that is 20 thousandths of an inch, this thickness, it's 20 thousandths of an inch plus however much the teeth are sticking out on this side and however much the teeth are sticking out on that side. So in this case, it's 24 thousandths because we have two thousandths of an inch set per side. And you see how that fits in there? It's just nice and snug. It allows it to go through, but it does not bind. And it doesn't have excessive set. If it has excessive set, then it has a tendency to wobble. And when you're sawing, that means your blade can go left, right, wherever it wants. But when you have just a very minimal amount of set, it keeps the saw going in that direction. So what that does is it produces a nice straight saw cut so straight is defined as the shortest distance between two points so we're not talking square but we're just talking is straight so if i put that straight edge on there you can see that now why that's important in particularly in joinery is this when it comes time to making a dovetail or a mortise and tenon, the straighter the cut, the smoother and flatter the surface, the better will be the joint when you put the two pieces together. See that? Disappears. And you can spin it around so as not to, not to uh, think that you're just aligning grooves. You, you don't see the difference because the color of the wood on that side. But when you put it in there, that completely disappears. So that's critical. And it's critical because it prevents you from having to go in and do anything more to it. The side of that tail and the side of that pin are already established. They're nice and flat. You get a nice, good glue joint. That's the reason why I say that your dovetails, 70% of the success of your dovetail is your saw. If your saw doesn't do that, you got a ton of work to do. If your saw does do that, you just have to learn where to put the saw. Did you find a piece, Ken? No. Oh, they weren't there? Oh, shoot, maybe you moved them. There's a whole pile of them already cut up, and they were sitting in behind those, you know, where he buffs everything, but maybe, maybe he'd... Yeah. Yeah, you know, where Ian does all the buffing. That's assuming that he didn't have just enough cut for however many saws he was doing that day, but... Next, Frick. Here, hey. Ken. Ken. Can found one. Okay. Who who was talking about protecting their saw? I don't know. So here you go. I apologize for forgetting. Short memory. So this is just a. Can you come in on this, Jake? Where can they get this stuff? Is it something else that we just? It is something else. And we use it for this purpose. Yeah. We should, we should offer it for sale. It doesn't cost anything, but if you wanted it, you'd have a hard time trying to find it. So I can't remember which way I find easier to go. This, you just slip that on. I think it actually goes on, on easier this way. Yeah, against the, uh, against the, uh, against the what? Teeth. 
Against the teeth. A rip, I guess. And when I get doing this a lot, I can usually get that on there real quick. Come on. Am I convincing anybody? Where? So that's as good a way as I can think of it. Protect your saw. And then you can put them together and you're not, uh, you're not knocking the corners off of your teeth. Okay, next frick, please. Next one comes from Clayton Cox in Pasadena, Maryland. Clayton in Pasadena? I've been to Pasadena. Do you file sloped gullets on cross-cut handsaws? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part you said. Do you file sloped gullets on cross-cut handsaws? Sloped? Gullets. Gullets? On cross-cut handsaws. On cross-cut handsaws. Sloped gullets. Mm. No. Well, I think I, I, I think I know what he's talking about, but I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I, I, and, I, and I'm not, uh, I don't, shar I sharpen tons of rip saws, hundreds if not thousands, because I used to have to do every saw that we put out. We don't do, I don't do a whole lot of cross cuts, but I think I've seen people that would actually lay the saw over like that when they, when they file, which would give you a sloped gullet if that's what he's referring to. That's what I thought he was referring to. It's so small, I don't know if it makes any difference. Now, on a bigger saw, it would. Yeah, it might. Sorry, I just didn't give you much of an answer, but it was the best I could do. Maybe somebody in the audience and on the chat can kick in. Next, Rick. Um, next one comes from Daniel in Ireland. Hey, Daniel. Why don't you have a saw sharpening kit like you do for planes? Why don't we have a saw sharpening kit like we do for planes? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, what would go into a saw sharpening kit? Actually, we've talked about this before, but it's a, it's a bit of a pain to put together kits on the website. And I don't understand that part because I don't want to, but Luther and Jake could deal with it. Uh, so what, would, what do we have that we would include? A file. You know, I, I throw some maintenance stuff in there, but there really isn't that much. I mean, you need a vise. You can make your own vise. We did, uh, we did a YouTube or a newsletter. What did we do? YouTube. We did a YouTube video on making this vise. And I made this vise a little fairly specific so I could sharpen, I could sharpen my, uh, cross, my uh, dovetail and my tenon. And I didn't want to have to move it because this gets in the way. But I made it so that I hollowed out, I hollowed out for the handle. And then when you put that in there, it's well supported and you can go in and file. So you need, you need a vise, you need a file. Uh, if you want to go complete, you need a saw set and we have, we've got Chris, uh, our engineer, kind of working on a saw set, <coughs> but not a high pri not a high priority because it's probably uh, you're the first person that's asked in the last three years, so it's not um, not a big demand. Unlike a plane, uh, unlike the necessity of sharpening chisels or planes, which is something you're doing multiple times a day. A day this is not something you're doing multiple times. People always ask, how often do you need to sharpen a dovetail saw? Well, if you think about how many lineal feet you actually cut when you cut a dovetail, you, uh, you, you, can, get a, you can get a couple of years between sharpening. You more often give your saw away than sharpen it. I give it away? Well, for whatever reason. Yeah. So it's, it's, not, it's not quite, it's definitely not in the same league well, as sharpening planes and, and we chisels. only sell the file yeah well i mean we, we we're going to do a maintenance kit because you could have you could use the uh the mm, camellia oil 
And the sand, the Sandiflex would be the Luther variety, which is that abrasive that you use. So we really don't have a whole lot to provide to put a kit together like that. Next, Rick, please. Uh, Colin McLeod in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Hey, Colin. I mean, I know Colin McLeod, do we not? He wants to know how often you sharpen your dovetail saw. Uh, well, Jake said I end up giving it away more frequently than I sharpen it. Uh, I don't, I, uh, if I was just had one saw that I was using, I probably wouldn't sharpen more than once. I might do it once a year. It's, it really, and a, 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 a dull cross, a dull rip saw will still cut fairly well, unlike a cross cut saw. You want really good performance out of a cross cut saw, it needs to be sharp. You want decent performance out of a dovetail saw, you can get it with it being a lot less than 100% sharp, if that makes any sense. But it doesn't, it doesn't take a whole lot to do it. It's really simple. You need to make a little vise like that. Go to YouTube. Then you want to you match, uh, match the tooth count or tooth size, which count would be the same thing with the appropriate file. So let me do a little promo on the files. Where's my little one, Jake? Here it is. So, uh, those are not the different sizes. They aren't. Well, these two are the same size. Oh, where's the other one then? I don't know. Probably that one on the le right on the left side of them. Right there? No. no, that's what I just put down. Well, somewhere in here, I've got another one, but these were these. Were, this is for your dovetail saw, your joinery cross cut. No. This is this no is one. For your three quarter. Three quarter, but you could do it. You could use it on this as well. Mm. Yes, you can. You can use it on that, or you could also use this. What's really nice about these is you see how sharp the points are. They come to a nice sharp point. It gives you a nice, nice sharp gullet and tooth. So you want to make it easy. And when don't we want to make it easy? I should say now. If you want to make it difficult, take a sharpie and go in there and paint the teeth, it'll ruin your Sharpie. So take an old Sharpie that's toast. Round nose. Paint, paint, oh, paint your teeth, you usually go down like that, but that's what I said, that'll ruin your Sharpie. And this just helps you identify which tooth you've done. Change your ball cap for a pair of better eyes. And then you're gonna set your, so you're gonna set your file in there and just mirror the gullet, or the, the uh, angle that was already there. Otherwise, you can go in there and use a square or a protractor, and you can get it set. Now, if you're new to this, then what you're going to want to do is to take a popsicle stick or make a piece of wood the size of a popsicle stick. I may as well do it. I actually just have something right there. So I need a, uh, I need a drill. I'll use my Yankee drill. And about that size. I'm going to give you a little tour of what's going on with our tool cabinet. I know you're interested. Put that in there. Find the middle. I don't want to chew that up. Find the middle of your So you're coming in here, you're finding that angle that you want. I'll go back here where the big teeth are. When you get the angle, then you're gonna stick this on the oh, I made it too big. Pull it on. The file's tapered. Okay. Put it so it's level. And then with each stroke you can tell whether or not you're tipping. And you're gonna use that marker to determine where you go. Now when I do this, I stroke and I pull back without, re without lifting it up. Cause they're too small, it's too hard to try to set it back down. So I go one, back, two, back, three if need be, depending how dull it is. 
and then I, I literally feel it go up and drop down into the next gullet and then repeat the process. You're perpendicular to the run of the blade, so that part's pretty easy to guess when you're doing a dovetail saw. You know, you want that to be square to the blade and you just go all the way down. Do the same number of passes, apply the same amount of pressure so you don't end up ruining your tooth line. And then, uh, now I, I, at one point I, I experimented with, okay, all the teeth sticking out this way should be filed from this direction. And all the teeth sticking out that way should be followed from this direction. What a pain in the butt that was for no, no gain whatsoever. You have to do that when you're doing a, filing a uh, cross cut, but on a dovetail or any kind of rip, don't bother. Not worth it. You'd never know the difference. Next, Rick, please. Uh, Dan in Culpeper, Virginia. Culpeper? Sure. Isn't it C-O-L? C-U-L. Fuel, coal, coal pepper, coal pepper. What indicates when you should joint the saw blade before sharpening the teeth? Well, if you look down the tooth line, didn't we just do this video, Jake? Has it been released yet? Jointing? Yeah. It's on YouTube, we just did one. So when you look down your tooth line and it's doing this, usually it's doing this, well, go fix it. So as long as it's relatively straight, no worries. And it's not that big of a deal, but if it gets really out of whack, and then you got to go in with the file and hold your file square to the blade. And this, this is true of all your saws. Square to, you know, don't want to tip it one way or the other. And you're going to file until you touch, you're touching, at least touching all the tops of the teeth. Some, some obviously you're going to wipe out, you're going to make a much, you're a bigger flat spot than others, but and then you've got to bring them all back into a line, which means if these ones are really have wide flat spots, because the saw would look like this, and this I'm just barely touching, I'm going to be filing a lot more on these, tapering off less and less and less and less, and then as you go this way, more, 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 do you get it back to where you want it. Now, how many people do we have on, Frick? Uh, 428. All right, 428. I'm going to tell you a little something. Um, Ken, do you want to explain to them what that's all about? You have the camp mi microphone there? So Ken's going to talk to you about what, we, this still applies to both Canada and the United States? Uh, it, I don't know. I should know. Just U.S., I think. Can you, you hear me? We him don't part? have the Canadian one up yet anyway. A little closer, Ken. Yeah, we don't have the Canadian site up yet. You can so, put Ken on the camera? So they may as well be looking at him while they're listening to him. Uh, anyway, we have this, uh, we have an agreement now with double the donation. So if you go on the PHP website, uh, to do that, and click that's, that's purple, the, 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 the purpleheartproject.org website, and click on the donate button and scroll down, you'll see a box that Is says. Everybody doing it? double the donation and you can enter your employer's information in there. Most big companies have that option. If you're giving to a charity, a lot of big companies will match the donation. So there's a spot on the donation page to check if your employer does that. And if you select that option, then your donation will be doubled. Awesome. So we would be fine Costco on there, Frick? I don't know. Do you haven't donated? The Costco? <laughs> no. The PHP. <laughs> yes. Ken, uh, if you're a combat wounded vet and you've been to our class, we know you, you need to uh, give a shout out so we can give a shout out to you. So that would be in the chat down below. That would be at Ken. At Ken. That's it. And he'll, he'll, uh, he'll find you. And then every once in a while I'll stop and he'll read out the names and we'll give a big shout out. I also got to give a big shout out to Jesse, per Jesse Rufiange and Kyle Perel. Um, I'll, go, I'll get Jake to bring some of the stuff over and tell you a little story behind that. And big shout out to Angie. Angie, is, Angie and her sister Lynn package up all of our Purple Heart t-shirts. And soon our Purple Heart t-shirts are going to have on the side... What's it say? Supported by, Supported by 
Yeah, supported by RC Woodworking. Yeah, buy up the old ones. On the sharpening topic. On the sharpening topic. John I'll Adams had a follow-up. He said, uh, to be clear, you have to file from a specific direction for all cross-cut saws, but can you go into a little more detail? Well, yeah, you're, uh, so, uh, where's my, where's my sample? Let's see if I can find it. Just start explaining. Well, no, I'll explain it when you find it. So in the meantime, let's go on to another question. Frick, please. Uh, oh, wait a minute, sorry. Ken, do you have anybody to shout out to? Uh, just yeah, a few. Uh, Michael Delvoy. Hey, Michael. Delvoy. Uh, JB, John Brown. From hey, JB, Monaco. up the street. Fredericton. Jeff O'Connor's on. Jeffrey. And Artis Benson's on. Art, oh, uh, Dave's, yeah, yeah. she's going to take over. She'll be, she officially represents Dave. Excellent. As a wounded vet. And uh, Tom in Germany, he was in the class in August. 22. Oh, yeah, Tom. I remember. Uh, Kevin Burris is on. Hey, Kev. And Sibby's Kevin on. Burris is going to be with me, so I'll tell you, I'll, I'll announce this because we finalized it this week. Um, Jake. What's the, what's the dates with? It's like June 6th or 7th. It can't be like. Yes, it can. No, it can't. It's, it's got to be the actual of, days. The weekend of June 6th and 7th. You sure? Yes. Okay, the weekend of June 6th and 7th. Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday. Mel is celebrating 45 years in business. Mel owns Exotic Woods in Burlington, Ontario. That's just across the border near Toronto, and he has, uh, I think he's, I think his facility is the largest that I've ever seen in terms of a supply of uh, world of woods. And um, great guy, really good guy, uh, has a special music room that they keep hydrated, perfectly balanced, and that's where you go in and spend lots of money. Anyway, so he's gonna do a little bit of a mini wood show to celebrate. So Jake and I and Kevin Burris will be there, set up with our benches, demonstrating. And there'll be some others to, yet to be announced. So if you're interested, and there'll be, there'll be wood deals. And we're going to have a bunch of tools with us too. So if you're anywhere near and you want to stop in and say hello and pick up something, we'll have lots of inventory with us. And you said Sibby was on? Yeah. Sibby from Denmark? Yeah. Denmark. Somebody, some, Denmark? No. Sibby is from Iceland. Casper is from Denmark. Oh, Casper. Sorry. Sibby's the pilot. Sorry, Sib. Pilot from Iceland. Hey, I have to get... You're getting I'm old. Getting, I'm getting old. Yeah. Anyway. Hey, anybody else, Ken? That's it? All right. <laughs> My bad. Go for it. Uh, this is from, I can't say this name, Krog, maybe? Krog Hertel. How do you spell it? K-R-A-G-H. K-R-A-G-H. I would just spell that. And he's from Ada, Michigan. He says, it, is it practical to convert a vintage crosscut saw to a rip saw? I cannot find rips, but lots of crosscuts. Um, yeah, why not? Um... Now you're going to have a fair bit of filing to do because the tooth is laid back a lot on a cross cut and you want it to be almost perpendicular on a rip. But sure, it's the same saw plate, same everything. By the time you wipe off all that tooth, though, you probably have to redo the set. But yes, you can, you can convert. You can, do, you can go either way. Rip to cross cut, cross cut to rip, as long as you know what you're doing with the file. Next, Rick. Uh... Clinton Cox in Pasadena. Clinton. How do you file the saws you make before you ship them? They are perfectly sharpened and cut so smooth. Oh, we have good friends that do that. So our blade, we get our blades from a company in Japan, and they cut them with a diamond saw, and they come to us perfect. They come perfect. They were here, they were here. Do you remember how to pronounce their names? Right, Frick? <laughs> uh? No, I don't know. 
Uh, yeah. Shintero was Shintero. one. Jake, what was what was Shintero's friend's uh, friend's name that they came to visit us? Saw. Shintero Namba. They came and they spent a couple a day or two with us and had uh, had a great time. We took them out on the river. Wonderful, wonderful people and uh, very good businessmen. It was awesome. But yes, they make our blades. Next, Rick. What are you looking for, Ken? Uh, oh. Rick, I'm waiting on you. Huh? Uh, this one comes from the chat, Rex Hansen. Rex Hansen. Now, I've... I've stayed with someone named Rex Hansen once, twice, three times. Rex is out in Boise, Idaho, a good friend of mine. Just completed a two-year course in Massachusetts at, at, at the, uh, oh, what's the name of the school? In Massachusetts. I, it just, I, I just drew a blank, but I know Rex. What's he said? What's what? He's what's asking. He want? says, "There's lots of saw set tools out there. Do you have a preferred saw set tool?" Well, I haven't found one we really like because most of them, the plunger is too wide and it, it'll hit more than one tooth. So no, we haven't. That's why we're trying to. That's why we're trying to make our own so we can get it exactly the way we want. And if we do, it'll only have. It'll only do two thou and three thou. I don't care about the others. I'm not making it for that. I'm making it specifically for our saw. That one's a little bit on the back burner. It's another one of those, you know. You get to a point where you have to, um, you have to make things that have sufficient market so that it, you can pay for all the R&D that goes into it. It's like the plane that we're making. There's a tremendous amount of time, money being spent on developing it. That's why we're not going to do the whole... One to eight. We're only going to do the ones that sell. that sell that people want. So starting off with a five and a half, and probably do a block plane after that, or a scrub plane. Luther Chet and the uh, Costco does participate in the double donation. Oh, there you go, Frick. Yeah. You can donate. Double your money, Frick. So for every yeah, thousand that, you put in, us doubling Frick's money. For every thousand you put in, Costco will put in a thousand. So I'll remember that when we're right on the edge and we need like an extra three or four thousand. Are you done? Sil Are you He's done? gone silent. <laughs> um, you want another question? Don't check RC woodworking. Yeah, so you're fire away. Uh, Jeff Schnob in the chat. He says, I have all Swanstone handles. Is it possible to update them with your resin impregnated maple handles? Uh, depends on the vintage. And, and yeah, so when, for the first, we started making saws in 2008. When did our, when did we get our CNC machine, Jake? 21. So from 2008 to 2021, I dealt, I did them and I, I drilled them. There was no, uh, it was, it was done by hand. So there was nothing. How did I used to drill the holes, Ken? Do you remember? In what? In the, in the saw handles. We, we, we would have had to jig it somehow, but I don't remember either. It's funny. You do it that long, and then you forget as soon as you stop. All I'm saying is that there's no guarantee that the holes would line up. In fact, chances are they wouldn't. Now they would because they're all done with CNC. So depending on when you bought your saws, there's a, there's a possibility. But you know what? Uh, I do that, especially wooden, wooden handles are, that's not something that just gets pumped out. That's, that's still a, a labor of love. So I'm going to say probably not. So, oh, I slept well. I should tell them my little uh, health secret, shouldn't I? Yeah, I'm gonna t I'm gonna tell you something for your own benefit. Just hear me out. So I'm f I'm 63 this year. 
So if you're anywhere near my age, you get up and go to the bathroom multiple times during the night, at least once. Sometimes I was getting up four times, I think maybe even five. So disruptive to my sleep. So my wife found this information from this Australian lady and it involved Celtic salt. Well, there's lots of, type of different types of salt. There's pink Himalayan, there's Celtic, there's white table salt. We don't use white table salt. But this Celtic salt has 82 essential minerals in it. So this, bar this lady named Barbara O'Neill was talking about the fact that if you're the type of person that drinks a glass of water and then goes to the bathroom 10 minutes later, the water is not getting into your cells. And this kind of makes a little bit of sense. Can't just, water can't just dump into your cell. Everything moves through the cell wall with the aid of a mineral or something else. Anyway, so she suggested take a little pinch of Celtic salt before every glass of water. So I started doing it. I've probably been doing it now for two months. Go to bed at midnight, and I don't wake up until 7 o'clock, 8, 7.30 in the morning. That's cute. Doesn't he mean 9.30, Ken? Well, it depends on which day of the week. Point is, I sleep through the night. Now, I'm not here to give you health advice. I'm just sharing with you mine. But wow, what a blessing to get a good night's sleep and not wake up multiple times is worth its weight in gold because it turns your day from a uh to a fantastic. North Bennett. North, North Bennett Street School. That, yeah, yeah, that's where, that's where Rex went. Now, did we ever find those? Uh, we didn't? Well, if you can imagine that the tooth is laying out like that, and the cutting edge, the, the actual cutting edge is on the outside. So if you're filing this way against that cutting edge, you're catching on the sharp edge. But if you file this way out, out past the cutting edge, it's a much nicer feel. It's kind of like planing with the grain versus planing against the grain. You plane with the grain and it gets stuck. You plane, you plane against the grain, it gets stuck. You plane with the grain, it goes off smoothly. So if your teeth are sticking out like this, then the, this tooth gets filed this way, and this tooth is sticking out on this side gets filed from the opposite side out. Hope so that you, made sense. You file from the, from the back to the front. File from the, from the, from the inside to the, uh, toward the outside, instead of from the outside toward the inside. That's a good way. Next, Rick. Uh, Anthony Eastham Hi, in Anthony. the chat. He says, what's a good low-tech way to check and set teeth? A good low tech way? I don't know. I mean, I've I've seen Tay Frid talked about doing it with a screwdriver, and I just I can't imagine. I suppose if you did something all the time, you could. But I'm fussy. I want my saw to give me a perfection with every stroke. So it has to be done right. I don't know if there is a low tech way. I don't know of it. I, I have I have one of these that I use. I'll show it to you. Where's the blue one, Jake? Which one? The, the blue, the, the turquoise blue. I didn't know you used one. Yeah, so I have the one that I, that I, I don't know where it is. Oh, wait a minute. One that, there's one that guy modified. Yeah, this one right here. To put the, the depth adjustment on. Had a customer sent this to us, and his. We're just going to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Where's he going? What's he saying? Oh, he's got to get salt. This, the the uh, plunger in this does not look right. Anyway, he had, he had a good idea, and he had this in here so that it would limit how far it would push the plunger. But um, And that's probably because I don't think they allow for a fine enough set with their anvil. So uh, the bottom part of the plunger, the bottom part of the plunger grabs hold of the blade, of, of the saw, the blade. So now the blade doesn't move. Now the pressure, oh, this, that's how it works, yeah. So the bottom part of the plunger squeezes first and that holds the blade tight against the flat part of the anvil. And then the plunger comes out and pushes over on the tooth. Well, normally the stop would be the, the anvil, right? This would push it over until it pushes it up against that anvil. But because the anvil 
is got has too much slope on it, he put a stop down here so that as you start pushing on the tooth, it'll only go so far when this bottoms out and that gives you your minimal set. So that's just a really and good idea. And the bottoming idea. out is adjustable. Yeah, you, yeah you, can, you can bring that out farther or not as far, depending on what you need. And that would control how much that tooth gets pushed over. And there's probably there's some spring, if you're gonna do this yourself, there's some spring back, right? So you've got to allow for that. And you may, you may, have, you may have to push the tooth over this far in order to have it stop back here. All right, he's gone talk about that stuff. What stuff? Right there. Oh, so where is he? Oh, there he's coming. Frick? Yes? You're leaving us, brother. I'm busy. So, um, where do I start? Do, running this Purple Heart project that we've been doing for this, our ninth year, uh, Jake and I started it in 2016. Had no idea what we were doing, just felt like this is something we need to do. So our first class, we had uh, seven combat wounded vets from the United States. They came, we didn't know what to expect. It was fantastic. And uh, some people had found out what we were doing and gave us some money to do it with. So we decided to plan two more that spring, the following spring. But there was no money. <laughs> anyway, we just went ahead and did it anyway, figured the money would find us. Um, the, and then uh, Luther came on board. And Woodcraft really stepped up to the plate. Woodcraft helped us. They came up with a name, helped us come up with a name. They put us on the cover of their catalog. Um, they gave us money. And a lot of the stores stepped up. I mean, in, in, uh, Everett, Everett, who owns the store in Knoxville, Tennessee, came to me and said, Rob, every time you do your class, I'll cover the expense of one soldier. So we had that kind of, that kind of support. And then we got real serious. And then we started to do six classes a year. Well, we can't do any more in six classes because the weather is such where we live that you can't, you can't plan to bring 20 air flights and, uh, and expect them all to arrive in January. So we'd start in April, which is risky because it's, I mean, we're getting snow all night tonight and the class starts in three weeks. So we almost always get snow in April and we go through to October. But um, a lot of, uh, now, so now we have 42 wounded vets that come in during that time. We've had them from far away as Australia. Now we feed them, whereas we used to go to restaurants, but uh, that took a lot of extra time. Now we can, we get a lot of extra bench time because we have a kitchen that we built. We've got a dining hall. Now we've even got, we, we had problems with accommodations. They were canceling on us. Now we have the, our own accommodations right here. We have rooms that we put the vets in. So everything is under the same roof. It's fantastic. A lot of people, a lot of people help make this happen. Um, Jesse Rufianch and Kyle Perel were the first two Canadians that we had. First two foreigner, first two non-US that we had. They came in 2017. And uh, I've, made, I've stayed in touch with both of those guys as, as much as any of the others. Kyle's in Newfoundland, and Kyle's come over here and been my assistant I don't know how many times. And um, Jesse, who was out west, retired, went to uh, furniture making school, and then he and his family moved to Nova Scotia, and he now makes a lot of stuff for us. He makes wind, our winding sticks, panel gauges, dovetail markers, drawer bottom planes. If I forgot something, mention it. So two things arrived this week. Kyle sent us this box. Now box this, box, right? it's a, well, it says in there, <laughs> he's, got some, he's got some notes. He must have been uh, doing something when he was right. He left some notes in here that I have no idea what they mean, but I'll tell you in a minute. So this box is a dovetailed wood hinge box. I love this size. I think he just, I think he just knocked the proportions out of the park. Just, I said, I got to measure that and make one just like that. It's just such a lovely size. The lid is Wenge, W-E-N-G-E, -E, African wood. The sides are bur the sides are walnut. The bottom is a piece of mahogany. 
He has a 3 8 wood hinge dowel hinge, just like, just like mine. Dovetails are flawless. I checked them over. He's got his little finger recess right here. And when you open it up, there's, a, there's an Afghanistan Zippo lighter. So I don't know what the significance of that is. I there didn't find it from, there wasn't? You just bought it from a guy in Afghanistan. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but it comes with it. So he gave this to us to give away as one of the prizes on our live that we do right now. We give away a prize for every thousand dollars we raise. So that was that was a, a lovely piece of craftsmanship that anybody would be uh, thrilled to win, and we'll give that away at some point. Can't promise. I am not done looking at it, so I might not go tonight. And then this other big box showed up, and this came from two boxes. This came from Jesse. Jesse Rufiange was uh, RCR. Royal Canadian Regiment, and there were six, 18, 18 charcuterie boards, cutting boards. Look at this one. I really love this. Look at the edge treatment that he did on that. Can you pick it up? Mm -hmm. How did he do that? I don't know. I don't know how he did it, whether he did it with a gouge, but uh, it's a lovely, a lovely cutting board. And I also like the fact that it's not just a rectangle. It's got a little bit of shape to it. See how the round sides? And uh, smaller shoot, smaller cutting boards. Just really nice, very tasteful, extremely well done. And we'll give these away as well. So huge shout out to those two guys. Uh, you know, I just, I always tip my hat to these people that don't forget their own soldiers. And they, these guys take care of one another. And I just think that's... That's enviable to have been part of a, a group of people that have that kind of concern for each other. Because what they're doing is saying, here, I'm, I'm making this stuff, get value out of it, and that value will be translated into buying plane tickets for the vets, food, the tools. We give each vet that comes five, four, in U.S. dollars, $4,000 worth of tools. Uh, thanks to Jack Lane and... Uh, Chris Chahusky and, and, and uh, Jim up in Moncton and three or four hundred volunteers. They build benches to our specs and they deliver them to the vet's home so they have a bench to work on. It's an awesome program. Be a part of it. Why not? Well, it's only money. But your money can bring you huge happiness when you do something like this. $1,063. How much? $1,063. $1,063. Well, we're going to have to pick that up a little. Hey, we're about to start. The bills start rolling in. The first, uh, what are we paying for plane fare now? Just so that you know, when we started this, our average plane fare was $500. And then 2021, 20, 20, I think it went up to 1000 2022, it was fifth, closer to 1500 I have no idea where it's going to be this year. But... Um, everything just keeps going up. And the, the girls in the kitchen tell me the food prices. They were telling me what lobster was up to. And, I, and they said, how can we afford that? I said, we do it. We do it regardless. We will come up with it. But, um, hey, price of doing business today. But, you know, <laughs> they didn't back away because of the level of danger that they were facing. So we're not going to back away on the level of service that we provide them. That's my commitment. Next, Frick, please. Uh, Michael Dodo in the chat. Hi, Michael. He says, what size file handle do you use to fit a file for 16 to 18 tip? TPI? I'm sure that's what he means. Uh, what size? Oh, that's a, those screw one. I don't know, Jake. Do you know what it is? It's not a screws on. It isn't? Oh, no, these weren't. So there's the ones that I, I like are called screws on, and they've, uh, they've just got really hardened... Um, threads and you just wind it on it'll grab onto the chisel and you can screw it right on these ones are just they've got a ferrule on the outside and you just tap that in but what size i don't think i don't think the size changes on these i'm most positive it doesn't no they're all the same size what we do to make them more user friendly is we tape them like a hockey stick and then we wrap grip, grip tape around that which just means you can get a hold of it and as long as you've got some control that way, you can make it do what you need it to do. 
Luther said the average plane fare for April is holding strong at a thousand. Oh, that's good. Does that mean prices have come down? Or in 2022 is pandemic. Oh, yeah. Um, Lockdowns. Somebody would like to know the measurements on that, quote, beautiful dark wood box. Oh, would that be Kyle? The one that Kyle got from Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Ken, Ken doesn't have his microphone on. It's a good thing. <laughs> Kyle, they're all, they're, they're, uh, they're uh, teaming up on you. Ganging up, that's what I meant to say. So this beautiful box measures, put my glasses on. Is he on? We all, all this talking about him and he's not even on? So it's 10 inches long. It is 5 and 15 16 inch wide. And its height is 2 and 5 eighths of an inch. Now, what also comes to play are the size of the pieces because it's very noticeable because I like, this, this is the way I make my boxes. I like it when the lid falls down between the sides so the top becomes flush. So the side pieces are a strong half inch and the side piece, the uh, front and back are three eighths of an inch. So that will that will determine what this looks like, and that's and that's a nice, a very nice look as well. So there you go. And I'll tell you, why don't you grab that run? Go in that big, go bring that big, the big board. I really like that. My wife liked it too. This is twelve and a half, and at its widest point, it's nine and a quarter. And I'm guessing it looks to be about an inch and a in, inch and seven sixteenths in thickness. This is the end grain of maple coming through, and he's got he's got a really deep finger recess in there too, so that makes it uh, really easy. That's one my my wife commented on that. She goes, "Oh, I can really get a hold of it." So here's the big one that he sent, and it has that texture everywhere, all the way around. That's his branding. And the side, so the side finger grooves are really deep. My fingers go in there half an inch. So there's no, uh, there's, there's, you're not going to drop it. And that's got some walnut. And if I was to identify, I don't think that, I think that's just uh, a lighter shade of maple. So two walnut strips in amongst a bunch of maple and grain. There you go. Lovely job, Jesse. Next, Frick. Can you let me know if we get some more guys to shout out to? Yeah, I got one now. Uh, Peter Dixon in Cheshire, UK. Hi, Peter. How can I reset a Cosman dovetail saw as no reset tools available to set two thousands? Oh. Mm hmm. Hmm. Uh, he wants to know how he can reset one of our teeth on one of our saws when he doesn't have a saw set. Well, he could set them over and then and then use the diamond stone to bring them back. Yeah, you mean to to line them up? I'm not going to suggest that to him though. Um, I would suggest that you find one of those. Copy that idea. That's probably the best idea to date. So this is a, this is a relatively easy to find um, saw set. Now, what I would do with this is somehow get in there and make that plunger a little smaller, and that could be easily filed to be smaller. And then you don't even have to worry about the anvil because what you're going to do is with this little doohickey he's got on here, and it's just, just got it held in place with a screw on the top and a band on the back. What that does is that controls how far over the plunger goes. So instead of using the anvil to push the tooth to the anvil, you're simply pushing the anvil against the tooth and stopping in midair. But you're stopping with, um, 
you're stopping under control, so it's only pushing it over so far. So this is, Jake, you want to have a closer look at that? What's wrong with Moose? He has to go home. Quit being a whiner. What? He wants to go home? He has to go home. Oh, he's mad because he has to go home. I think we all have to go home. Little, no, we don't. A little social animal. Okay, so there it is. So he's taken a, he's got a piece of, a block of steel. He's drilled and tapped it. So he could drill a hole through here with this screw, put that in place. I'm not sure why he had to add that in, but instead of just doing the same thing out here, but he didn't. So he's, he's a uh, welded or brazed two nuts, probably to this. And then, oh, I see, because you can't get at that screw head. So that is brazed onto the screw. So you can come in here with a wrench and you can turn that and that will allow you to change how far out that goes. And then you have to have the type that has the two-stage plunger. So that big plunger in there, that's what pushes your blade against the flat part of the anvil to hold the blade firm. And then up on the top, the little plunger comes out and it doesn't move much, but it just pushes a little bit of pressure against that tooth to move it over. So do your best to copy and manufacture something like that. And it didn't come with any copyright or uh, any kind of pro <laughs> intellectual property <laughs> protection. So I guess it's open to anybody. Ken, who have you got? Okay, Kim O'Connor. Hello, Kimberly. Check out, uh, check out 757, uh, uh, 757. Uh, oh shoot! What's her? What's the website? Seven five seven life. Seven five seven life. I don't know. Better check it. Better check it. Yeah. The I'll striped do that. tomato, but she, I think she has a separate website now for that. Kim makes really nice apparel, particularly if you're in Virginia. Living. No. Not a, it's living, isn't it? No. Seven five seven. Living. No, no. That's just what comes up when you Google oh, it. Oh, Frick's that, looking it up. That's not her. I can. Walter Rouse and I. Wally, up in Ontario. Hey Jerry, Vietnam. Joe Bright, way back Joseph. Joseph and I were just communicating. He's uh, he's just getting back into. He planed a piece of wood the other day. Dimensioned it. Felt wonderful. Wood is good, Joe. John Wallens. Hey John. July twenty-three. Sid Borden's on. Sid. What's his name, Jake? John. Jonathan Sidney. Jonathan Sidney. Sid works here. Uh, Ray Door. Ray, down in uh, Louisiana. John Beck. John Beck. John Santa Claus. John, another another Vietnam era vet, as was Ray. Good to hear from you, gentlemen and lady. Frank, ready for another question. Phil Lawrence is on. And Phil Lawrence. Hi, Phil. What's that, Fred? You want another question? I would. Uh, this is Dan. He says, is there a difference in approach to sharpening a panel saw, a back saw, or a frame saw? Is there a difference? In approach, yeah. Well, the, the difference is going to be in the tooth configuration. If it's a cross cut, you're going to file it in a different than you're going to file a rip. But as far as... The principles are you have to hold the tooth, you have to hold the blade very close. The blades are always going to be thin. So you can't hold it down here because it'll just vibrate on you terribly. So you always have to support the, the blade very close to the teeth. Um, you want to use a good file, and it's very difficult to find a good file. They look like they, they, they're rounded instead of corners, so they give you a wave instead of a nice sharp tooth with a nice sharp deep gullet. These are made by Grobay. We sourced them two years ago, so. So we have a selection of them on there. They're not expensive, but we also treat them. We, we do the handles up so you can actually get a hold of it and use it. Um, make sure you got lots of light. Make sure you can see what you're doing. And uh, make sure that every tooth, well, every rip tooth, has a cutting edge created by two surfaces. The back of one tooth, the front of the other. 
So you have to you have to you have to file both and make sure that that new surface comes right to the top. Crosscut tooth comes is comprised of three surfaces, so you've got three surfaces that are creating that point. So all three have to be filed to the same level. Other than that, there's a really good book. Shoot, I should have brought that down. There's a really good book if you can still find it. It's short. Um, I think it's actually right out here. So tell them a joke or something, Jake. Let's see if I can find it. Try to insert an ad. Uh, there it is right there. I got it. I got it. I don't know whether this is still going to be available or not. So it's called Keeping the Cutting Edge, Setting and Sharpening Hand and Power Saws by Harold H. Payson. And if I look in here, oh, it's, it was published by Wooden Boat, Wooden Boat Magazine, Wooden, Wooden Boat Books. I'll give you the ISBN. I'm just looking to see. So copyright 1983. And Harold doesn't have his, doesn't have his, oh, it's in Brooklyn, Maine. So not far away. By the looks of it, I don't think he's still alive. Published by Wooden Boat Publications, and that's in Brooklyn, Maine. The ISBN number, how can we put that on there without me having to read the thing out? I guess I'll have to read it out, right? The ISBN number is 0 937 822 02 7. So if you can find it, and it's just, it's just, uh, it's just illustrations, line, line drawn illustrations, easy to follow. There are some pictures, not a lot. And it's a, it's a very simple, very simple book. It was good. Now, there's also a really good video that you may still be able to get. He lives and works, and he lives and works in South Thomaston, Maine. Um, uh, there's a really good video called Saw Sharpening. That's all in the title. And Tom... Oh, what's his name? I know he's dead. Oh, shoot. Well, if you did a search on it, saw sharpening. I can't remember Tom's last name. No, no. But uh, he has a workbook that goes along with the video, too. So if you can get your hands on that, you'll have this mastered. What's it called? No, oh, no. oh, that book? Lee Nelson still has it? Well, there you go. $8. Amazon. Well spent. Amazon, how much? Say. Amazon has it as well. Look at that. My goodness, things are easy. Nine ninety five. Nine ninety five for Amazon. $8 from Lee Nelson. Support the little guy. Get it from Lee Nelson. Next, Rick, please. Uh, Paul Laws in Bledsoe, UK. How can, the Hi, set, how can the set be adjusted, and what is the optimum amount of set for accurate and even cutting? Well, that's, uh, there's, there's no one setting. So I'll, uh, I went through this earlier, but I'll, I'll do it again. If you're dealing with dry, stable furniture-grade woods, whether hardwood or softwood, and we're the only ones that do this, but I have just two thousandths of an inch set per side so that means the total set on my saws my bench saws are the thickness of a sheet of paper a total of four thousand two thousandths of an inch on either side and that cuts that makes the saw cut beautifully straight if you're dealing with um, woods with a higher moisture content up in the 15 20 then you're going to need more set than that, probably double, 4,000, maybe even more. Everybody else that I know of, every other, every other dovetail saw that I know of has 3,000 an inch set per side for a total of six. And uh, I, find that's, I find that just a little less than ideal. That's why we did two per side. Um, now, how do you do it? Well, 
first of all, in case you don't understand, there's your tooth line and the teeth all stick out like that. So what you want to try to do is make sure they stick out the same on one side as they do on the other. If you don't, and here's how you tell, if you start making a cut and the saw's drifting to the left or to the right, then you have more set on the side it's drifting toward. Right? It's creating more, more of a, um, it's following the path of least resistance. I don't know if that actually applies after I said it, but you always know whatever side it's drifting toward, that has the most set. So what you can do under that circumstance is take, your, take a, uh, best to use a diamond stone. And I say best to use a diamond stone because if you use a water stone or ceramic, it's going to wear your stone, wear, wear into your stone. So you take your diamond stone, you set your saw like that. Jake, you're going to need to see this. I should put this up on the, up behind me. Take your diamond stone. This is a fine stone. You don't want to use it too coarse because I want to do this in, in slight increments. Hold your thumb like that. And as you drag, oops, that was up on the ferrule. As you drag the blade with your thumb applying downward pressure and try to keep it uniform, you're taking off a little bit of that set. So I would immediately go over and I would make a test cut. If I'm still drifting toward that side, I come and I do it again. And I'll keep doing it until I no longer drift to that side. And when it's nice and straight, I know the saw, the set is balanced. So that's how you fix excessive set. That's how you fit, fix incorrect set, meaning more on one side than the other. If you don't have any set at all, then you've got to go in and apply some. And if you're going to do that, put your, put your magnifiers on. And I take a Sharpie and I go in and I touch... I touch the point of all the ones that are facing this way. So it would be every other. I do the same thing on that side. Otherwise, it's just too hard to see. I don't know. Where did I put that? Then I would go in there and I'd set that down. And I get up against the one I'm working on and I plunge it. And then I move to the next and I plunge it. And I move to the next and I plunge it. And I go all the way down the line, turn around and do the other side. And try your saw. If it cuts just the way you want, if it's a little too loose, then you need to go in and take a little bit off. Now, if it was cutting straight, but it, had, it was a little too sloppy, then you've got to go and you've got to take a stroke on the stone, flip it over and do the other side. Same amount of pressure, same number of strokes. And you just keep checking. I wouldn't do more than one stroke without stopping and checking with the saw cut to make sure that uh, it's coming off the way I want, meaning evenly. Okay, hopefully that'll something you can take and run with. Next, Frick. Am I lisping? Am I lisping? Because uh, I keep blowing air out through that. Kyle sent that note. Kyle is on? I Kyle who? Kyle. Kyle Pearl? Kyle. He Kyle. said that that note that says, not a finger jointed wood hinge box, is a dig at how Rob makes them all finger jointed now. Oh, it's a dig. Okay. Okay, it's a dig. What about the Zippo lighter? What's the... Or did you I already tell you that? I, yeah, I already told you. Oh, okay. I thought maybe it was a something really clever. Frick, For, do you want to demonstrate how you used to you be able to light... Uh, get your lighter to work? Yeah, but there's no uh, fluid in it. No fuel? I oh, probably couldn't ship it with the fuel. Next. Uh, Can Fred, you keep me posted if anybody else comes on to say hello to... Fred Smyers in the chat says, can you, Fred? Yeah, can you explain what hang angle is? Well, uh, I said, I mean, people talk about this, but it's the angle. So when I'm holding the saw in my hand, the angle that the tooth line would be in relation to my hand. So um, comfortable is right where I am. If it was up higher like that, then it's going, I'm on, I'm on a saw like this, by the way, some people saw on an angle like this. You find you have a lot more control. This is going to be a little bit of a long answer just because it's going to incorporate a few other things. Let me just clean some of this up. Forgot to mention Ken's here tonight helping us. Uh, Irvin's here tonight. 
Luther's on. Jake's behind the camera. Erica made supper. Elner, my mother-in-law, helped. I think Megan was out there. <coughs> A lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. Okay. So... If you cut like this, when you're starting the cut, you've got two teeth in the wood, and it makes it difficult to start. If you lay the saw down so that the saw is parallel to the top of the board, now you're spreading that pressure over 10 teeth, and it's a, you have a lot less grabbing, and you'll be able to start your saw far more precisely. So if that's the case, then I want, the, I want the angle of the handle in relation to this to be in a comfortable angle. So I don't want it up too far. I don't want it down too far. So I want it just right. And that's what mine is. So that is the hang, the, uh, whatever they call it, the hang. And this, um, they, it's not always the same on every one. This way, these are really uncomfortable because it's the way that you need to bend your wrist in order to hold onto it and you just don't get the grip. I have no use for that type of a handle. I much prefer this. And my, 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 all of our saw handles are the same. So that, that grip gets ingrained in your brain and in your hand. And every one of our saws that you pick up, it's always going to feel the exact same. So in a dark room, you'll know where zero is, where 10 degrees is that way, where 10 degrees is that way. Highly advantageous to be able to get to a point, to get to a point where you can saw angles by feel alone. You don't have to uh, be staring at the line. Next, Rick. Uh, Ron Danner in the chat. Ron, how are you? Are there certain tasks or procedures that cause a saw to dull that one should avoid? <laughs> Nails. I had somebody saw, I had somebody send a dovetail saw back one time he was, he knew he shouldn't have done it. He was uh, having to cut the bottom, having to cut the, he was putting hardwood floor in his house, I think, and he had to cut the bottom of the jam. And uh, thought, oh, I could use my dovetail saw for that. And sure enough, went right into a nail. So don't cut concrete, don't cut nails. And there are some woods. I mean, you get into some of the exotic food over there, and I guarantee you, you're not going to get two years of cutting if that's all you're, if you're sawing. So really hard abrasive woods are obviously gonna be more, are gonna be harder on the tooth than uh, something like poplar, which that's a piece of poplar that I was sailing through. And that's, that's some of that stuff is as easy to saw as, as, as is pine. So next, Rick. <coughs> What is the best method for cleaning rust from a saw blade? That's from Paul in the chat. Hi, Paul. Um, the absolute best that we found is this thing. We have them on our website. It's called a sand flex, unless you talk to Luther, and then it's a, a sand flex. You going to bring a saw in? I think this might be a fine. You, you, okay, you're going to have to go grab one of those. Pause that. Or we're going to pause that question until Jake comes back with everything, and I'll show you how it works, and it's lickety split. Next, Frick. Paul Pinto in the chat says, Hi, how Paul. do you... Hi, Everybody named Paul tonight? Yeah, there's a lot of Pauls. How do you determine what size file to use? Well, you want... You, when, you put your, when you put your file in the gullet, you want the... You don't want the tooth... You don't want the top of the tooth to cross the halfway point. Because if you do then when you're, you're going to be wearing part of your file out uh, faster than the rest. Now, to try to make that make sense, I have, where are, Luther made, we teach this when we teach our class. We just looked for them, we couldn't find them. So they're somewhere, somewhere put away so that we won't lose them, which is exactly what happens. Oh, it's right here. So here's the, here's, the, uh, here's the smaller one. This much came. So if this is your triangular file, and you're setting the file down in the gullet, if, 
if the part that you're actually filing, the tooth, goes up higher than the halfway mark. So, uh, okay. So I set my I set my file in here. Now, if the face of the tooth were to go beyond the halfway point, when I'm using this side, I'm that area in the middle is being filed twice is being used twice as often as as the rest of it. So you're going to get a dull spot in the middle of your file. So have it so that the top of your tooth does not go beyond the halfway mark and you get more life out of your file. And of course, you, you also want to match it too because the smaller the file, the, the smaller that little, that point is going to be and then you know, a little tiny teeth, you don't want to wipe them out and you don't want waves, you want nice sharp teeth. And, there, and if all else fails, just go by the guide. You know, a four, four or five inch double extra slim taper file is good for something up to, uh, or down to uh, you know, maybe 12 teeth per inch. Remember, the lower the number, the bigger the file needs to be. Did you get uh, a file, a saw? Yeah, I need a, I need a green Sandiflex. What? Okay, next Rick. Uh, this one comes from MacGyver in the chat. MacGyver. He says, how can I sharpen my bow slash frame saw blades? Um, well, providing the, the, the blade is big enough to get a hold of. Now, I do, I have, uh, here's right here. I have what you would call an antique saw file right here. And these are not hard to find. There's a lot of these still in the wild. Now this would uh, allow me to get a hold of, the reason why I made the one I made is because I can get, see this one? I can't get that last half inch because it bumps into the, uh, the saw, but I can get the entire thing. So this one works the same way and you would get in there and squeeze that in place. Now, if you were filing a bow saw, which is essentially like a bandsaw blade, I think I would have a tendency to just replace them. But you would just have to, you would put a section in close to the tooth or close to this file, file it, mark it somehow, move it forward, tighten it up, just keep going that way. And if it's big and round, it's not, not gonna hurt anything to be pushing it flat between that little section. And depending on, I mean, just copy whatever it had on it. If it had a, if it had a rip tooth, copy it as a rip tooth. If it had a crosscut tooth, it's going to be a lot more work. And and I mean, bandsaw blades are cheap enough that shoot, I'd have a tendency to just go replace it. But um, now I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you this uh, method of cleaning, cleaning your old saws. So here we have a, here we have an old saw. And here we have a sand, sand flex, which is a, an, an abrasive in a rubber compound and it goes all the way through. So you don't have to worry. It's that you're not just wearing it off like sandpaper. So you just come in here. depending on how bad it is. If it's pitted, well, you're not gonna be able to get rid of it, but it works really well on brass. I'll show you. As far as removing the oxidation on brass. That looks like new. And they're not expensive. How much are they? Seven? Uh, Five? Five dollars. So. And they, they come in three different colors. And the colors uh, correspond with the grit. So we have yellow, 
Red and green. Yellow is fine. 220 grit. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Green is medium. 120 grit. Red is coarse. Any guess? 80? Yeah. So if you use the fine one when you should have been using a medium, you're going to get a shiny spot. And if you use a red when you should be using a green, you're going to get a rough spot. So most, it seems like everything, I mean, Lee Nelson planes, our saws, the green is the one to, to use. It doesn't, uh, it just blends right in. And that's even if, I mean, I'm talking about if you have to remove a little bit of rust or mark. So here's, here's my number six. And I've got, I don't know what that is, but some marks might be, might even be rust. So I can go in, Jake, they can't see from there. Brings you right back to looking new. That's actually a little bit of rust because it's a little bit of pitting. Cleans up nicely and, and uh, relatively quickly too. Looking to see if they... It's time to go. Huh? We're out of time. No, we're not. What are you talking about? It's 22. What do you got? Um, Jerry Frank, please describe the correct procedure to restore the teeth of an old vintage saw. I've seen videos where they file the teeth away and cut new, which seems excessive. Well, depends on how bad the teeth are. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever done that, but I did see how somebody did it. What he did is he took a, he took a saw uh, that the teeth were good, they jointed the saw, which ended up removing a lot. And if you're going to change the teeth per inch, then you got to take it right down to nothing. And then what he did is he clamped a good saw up against this one, and he used that as a guide to file in the teeth. It's a lot of work. Wow. I don't know, I don't know how anxious I would be to do that. But certainly you can do it. Make sure you have good files and, and new files so that they're sharp and they cut fast. And make sure you have a good saw, vi uh, saw vise so that you can hold it and support it. Nothing worse than trying to file that thin steel and it's too far away from the support of the vise and it's vibrating and oof. So just be prepared for the work. So you just gotta go in and you gotta get it, you, you gotta get it so that they're all even. And that's the easiest way to do it is to use another, fi another saw and hold it up against it and file through, file through that good blade and then mimic that on the piece of blade behind it, which is the fun one you're restoring. Uh, there's probably good lots of articles. Uh, oh, that that what I just told you was I think is also covered in in this book, in restoring uh, restoring an old saw, and find that video. Did anybody find that video I was talking about? Tom Law, that was his name. Tom Law did a video called Saw Sharpening. And it's as good as one that you're going to find anywhere. And it's on DVD, so... I mean, he died probably in the early 2000s. But that in the chat. What, did he die? Tom Law. Tom Law, yeah. That's a good one to get. Next, Frick. Uh, Tom in Germany. Hey, Tom. Why should the gullet of a saw not be round? Rob always promotes to use a triangular file with sharp edges. Why shouldn't they be round? Well, you said why should the gullet of a saw not be round? Yeah, not be round. That's what I said. Why? Oh, sorry. I said why should? Why shouldn't they be round? Um, well, if you're if you're using a lousy file and it doesn't, it's not nice and pointed like that. Instead, it's rounded over. By the time you get in, your teeth end up end up looking like waves, and you don't have an appropriate cutting face on there. You think about it. You want that. You want, if you looked at this as the, you know, there's, there's the shape that you want of your tooth, and you want that cutting face to be, you don't want it to be rounded up like that, you want it to be straight, and you're only going to get that from an appropriate file, from a good file, so I would say it has partially to do with just the, 
proper cutting action of the tooth itself. So if your gullet is round, then you've taken away from the slope, from this front cutting slope of your actual tooth. You know, digest all that, it should make sense, hopefully. Next, Frick. Uh, Jeff Schnab in the chat. Hey, Jeff. Can you explain saw sharpening tech term, or sorry, can you explain saw sharpening terminology like slope, rake, and fleam? Uh, slope, rake, and fleam. Well, fleam, it refers to the angle. Where's my samples? Shoot. Just give me just one second. They might be right here. No. Yeah, I'll hit it right here. I wonder if we can find it. Yeah. So here. And I actually had somebody ask me this week, do you have any you ever put fleam on the, on your rip tooth? So here's a here's a rip saw. We cut in this direction. And the angle, the angle of the tooth is perpendicular to the run of the blade. So if there was fleam, it would be angled like this or like that. You have that on a cross cut, not on a rip. Okay. Um, what's the other one? Slope? Slope, rake, and, theme, and fleam. I don't know what he may refer to as slope, but the rake... The rake would be the angle of, of the, uh, yeah, so your tooth is like this, and your, this is the cutting face. So this is zero degrees, and the more you lay that back, the more you lay that back like this, the more relaxed the cut is going to be, not as aggressive. So real world example, um, some people that we buy our sauce claim that it was just a little hard. You get into hardwoods and it, and it, was, it would catch on them. So we recently changed. To, what did we change to, Ken? How much? Five degrees? It was no more than that. So what we did is we had, we had the... Um, rake. We had the rake angle of the tooth backed off about five degrees. So now when you go in there and cut, it's not quite as grabby, does it? It slows it down a bit, but I don't think you'll notice, but it's nice and smooth. And the last one he asked about was slope. And I'm not sure what he means by that. Well, just explain that flame is used on a crosscut. On a crosscut, so yeah. Your crosscut saw, the, each the tooth is gonna have an angle on, on the face of the tooth. And they're gonna be opposite. This one's this way. This one's that way. Oh yeah, remember this is, we were gonna talk about sharpening. So when you're sharpening this, when you're sharpening a cross cut, so this is the outside edge. This, is, this tooth is bent this way. So I'm gonna file it like this, as opposed to coming in this way, which would be like going against the grain. I'm going with the grain. It's a much smoother cut doing it that way. Okay. Where are we at, Ken, in terms of donations? Are we giving away the farm tonight? And do you have anybody for me to say hello to? You're adding up? Frick, another question while well, Ken's going to do that. 1496. 1496. All right, this one's from Paul Francoeur in the chat. Hi, Paul. He said, Rob previously said that the files he uses have very sharp corners, so you can file the bottom of the teeth to a sharp bullet. Does this matter? I thought the tip of the tooth is the important part. Well, it, uh, it, it yeah, yeah. What we're trying to say is we want, I can show it now. So if, you're, if your tooth is, how can I say this and make it make sense? I want, I want to have this face of this cutting face of the tooth, nice straight line from here to here. 
And if, you're, if your gullet is rounded over because your file is lousy, then you don't have that same amount of tooth actually doing the cutting. Does that make any sense? Think it would actually make a difference? I assume it would. Plus, you got, you got, remember, your sawdust has to go up in here. So the deeper this is, the more sawdust will go in there. The more sawdust goes in there means that's the more this tooth will cut. So once this gullet fills up, this tooth can no longer cut because there's no room for any more sawdust. So if this is rounded over and it's down into here instead of up into there, then you're going to stop cutting sooner. So you're going to get more efficient cutting by having a deep gullet. How much of it makes a difference? I don't know. Try it and see. Uh, somebody made a good point. What did, what's the good the sharp, point? The sharp corners of the gullet also aid in setting the teeth. Oh yeah, that is that. Yeah, that's a very good point. That very good point. So, if you're setting your tooth, you can set it. The tooth has it can bend all the way from here up, but if you've got a rounded gullet, a rounded gullet, then you're bending from about here up, which means you're going to have to set them a lot more frequently. Uh, it's just part of being Luther, precise. Luther said that slope means um, filing it parallel to the ground. So filing like this. And like this. Of the file? The angled gullet, the sloped gullet. Oh, yeah. So that metal, that metal uh, vice that I have, you can actually tilt so that when you're filing, when you're filing like this, the blade is actually laying out like that, so that would give you that sloped gullet. I don't know how much of a difference that would make, but I don't pay too much, too much attention to that. Welcome to Royce, who just joined us. Frick's all eager to get out of here because they're leaving at, uh, seven what do you got to be up by noon? Seven in the morning. They're leaving at seven in the morning. He and his wife, Erica, and his five boys, Bentley, Lincoln, Cooper, Cooper, McLaren, McLaren and, Royce. and Royce, along with Bo, my son, and Jake, and Megan, and little Moose, and Rex, and Rex and and Michaela, Michaela and her daughter and her daughter and Chloe and Kim and, and Kim Eleanor. and Eleanor my mother-in-law are all leaving here and driving to Portland Maine to get on an airplane commandeer it and go to Florida for three weeks or some portion of it I'm joining them Mitch and I are joining them on Wednesday and we'll be doing those classes Thursday, Friday, Saturday in, our, in Orlando and following Thursday, Friday, Saturday in uh, Clearwater. Now, the Thursday class is just a special one for the staff of the stores. And if you are a combat, I forgot to mention this, if you are a combat wounded veteran, I don't care whether that's a physical wound or PTSD or TBI, you are welcome to come to any, any of those classes on Friday or Saturday in either place, no charge. Complimentary from us and Woodcraft. So there's a charge for everybody else, but you guys, you guys get to come for free. Okay? Frick, you got another one last good question before we wrap it up? So you can get out of here nine minutes early? Well, we still have a draw. Are we doing a draw? Yeah. Um, 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 um. This one comes from Gary Nellis Woodworking. Hey, Gary. He says, I have a pair of panel saws, rip and crosscut, that were my grandfather's. They have been dull since I was a kid, but the plates are slightly bent but not kinked. Would you bother resharpening them? Well, whenever you say something like that, it belonged to your grandfather. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's like restoring. I mean, most, most planes post forty uh, World War II aren't worth fixing. But if it's, a, if it's an, a family treasure, then it is worth fixing. Now, I, let me qualify what I just said. People come to me and they want a plane. Don't go on eBay and buy some piece of junk that you're going to have to replace the blade and the chip breaker and do a ton of work to it. Shoot, Jake and I were shooting a video, a YouTube, the other day on uh, some more things you could do to fix your, make your plane work better. And we, we just took, we had, I got tons of old planes. Took a number six. And um, we took the frog out, took it off, stripped it, took the yoke off, couldn't get the lateral adjustment off. 
but we, we flattened the face of the frog and it was way out of flat, way out of flat. Then we showed you how to go in and, f and, and match or mate the contact surfaces on the underside of the frog to the contact surfaces down inside the sole of the plane. We did all of that, sharpened up, put a big thick blade in it, went to use it, and I was like, oh my goodness, what is wrong with this thing? Well, I knew almost right away. Because on a short board, you would get, you would, you would uh, get a hold of a shaving here, lose it, pick up a shaving here. So either that board wasn't straight or the sole of the plane wasn't flat. Sure enough, we checked it. It was eight thousandths of an inch out of flat. Put it on a reference plate and you could take an eight thousand shim and stick it in the middle. Well, it's a lot of work to fix. I wouldn't have even bothered if it wasn't the fact that we were set up to actually do stuff like that. So, fixing your grandfather's old saw. Yes, I would definitely do that. And that might even going in and, and restoring the handles and straightening the blade. It's not hard to straighten a bent blade. Just do it like I said. Grab it somehow right where the, where the kink is and just bend. You always have to bend more than you... You have to bend it farther than you would expect, obviously, in order to get it to uh, straighten out. And then you got to go through the process of restoring the teeth, joining it if possible, getting the edge straight, the cutting edge straight, that is. You may have to reshape the teeth, and uh, you're going to have to sharpen. You may have to reset, maybe not. But, you know, when you're all done, it's a labor of love, and you'll, you'll be thrilled. Pick up, pick up Tom Law's video on saw sharpening and pick up that book from Lee Nelson on uh, keeping the cutting edge, setting, sharpening, hand and power sauce. 2133. 2133. So we're going to give away two, two big prizes along with three dead cat sweaters. I'm ready. By the way, this past week I got to uh, meet... Uh, um, Pierre Polyev, who is uh, one of our political leaders, and I went to him to try to get bring awareness to how the plight of our wounded vets, governments aren't doing their job, and um, I gave him a jersey, a Purple Heart jersey. We have hockey jerseys that have the Purple Heart logo on the front, and every, on the back of every sweater is the name of one of the vets that had been to our class, and I had Kyle's. As one, Kyle was one of the first Canadian, first Canadian vets we had. So I gave that to him I, and said, I want this to remind you so that you get these guys taken care of. And I gave him a dead cat sweater. It's actually made out of a dead cat. No, it isn't. Long story behind that. Anyway, they're cozy, warm. They will keep you toasty on the coldest of days. And yet, on a, war, on a cool summer's night, they're just as applicable. So who's going to get the three dead cat sweaters, Rick? Thanks to Moose. Big shout out. Moose, by the way, just had eye surgery. His lens on his left eye had shifted, so he was looking through the edge of the lens, couldn't see anything. We had to change him from right wing, to, uh, from left wing to right, right wing to left wing because he couldn't see anything on that side. But he's all better now. Six weeks recovery, and he'd be good to go. All right, here we go. Three dead, dead cats. Six dead cats. Six. For three, sorry. <laughs> First one's going to Julie, two per, two Julie Kressler in Florida. Who? June? Julie. Julie. In Florida. In Florida. I'll bring it down. Congrats. Number, two, number two's going to William Hollingsworth in Alabama. William in Alabama. Congratulations. Last one's going to Michael Edgar in Hawthorne, California. Michael Edgar in Hawthorne, California. Congratulations. So what are we going to have away tonight, Dave, Jake? I think we need to save uh, Kyle's yeah. one. I can give her that. The smaller of the two. Smaller of the two? Ken, where are we at? Two, just over 2,000. 2144 now. So we'll give away this Jesse Rufiange. Lovely and with the texture on the side um, cutting board. And. Winding stick? What? All right, I'm drawing for the cutting board. She already won. Where did I put them? Can't win twice. Did you take them back out? You did. You put them right on. Cutting board's going to Michael Gagliano in Philadelphia. Hey, Michael, congratulations. 
and this charcuterie board that is walnut and it looks like is that, is that it's not ash it is ash and it's not there's a strip of walnut and there's a piece of cherry and ash nice charcuterie board where's that going that is going to David Farnham in Surrey, UK. David in Surrey, UK. Congratulations. Can we, should we give away one to uh, the audience and Instagram? No, because I don't have the list. Yeah, of you don't have a way of doing it. Okay. All right. We'll have to convert them to YouTube. Okay, folks. So when are we back? We don't know. <laughs> what do you mean we don't know? Well, why, I don't, why know. don't we know? Be the Saturday night. Oh, yeah. The so three weeks. Yeah. We also plan on doing a live from one of the seminars uh, down in Florida. If All I right. So yeah, there yeah, that's right too. So we'll, we'll we'll notify you. We're gonna do a live from one of the seminars we do down in Florida, and then our next live scheduled here will be on the Saturday before class number twenty-seven. Join us. You'll love it. I uh, hope every hope spring has sprung everywhere you are. I had sprung here, but then it went away because we got snow outside and cold weather. It'll, it'll go. Anyway, thanks for joining us. Appreciate your support. It really means a ton to these people, and it, uh, it's awesome to see. So have a good uh, couple of weeks, and we shall see you from sunny Florida sometime in the next couple of weeks. See you, Instagram. See you, YouTube. Take care, folks.